So we'll just start with where were you raised? I was born on the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. And when I was five years old, my mother got transferred from Rosebud to Shiprock. She worked for the Indian Health Service. And I lived in Shiprock um, at least until I was like 12. And then we moved to um, Kirtland, which was only what, 14 miles from Shiprock. <laughs> so most of my adult friends actually are from Shiprock because I grew up with them. And I just wanted to say this as far as tribal goes. Um, I grew up around Lakota speakers. And then when we moved to Shiprock, my mom married Navajo. So um, I claim Navajo site too, because my uh, stepfather was my stepfather from when I was six until I was 27. You know, so he was my father. Um, so I grew up around Navajo tradition and culture and um, ceremonies. And my first job after graduating from Fort Lewis was teaching Navajo history and culture at, at uh, Salmon College. Wow. So it's just a blend of learning. I, and I didn't even know that you were any different. I, I thought, you know, by seeing you when I was younger, I probably thought you were Sioux too. You know what I mean? It was just the language differences. And back in 1973, our folks still wore traditional attire. You know, you could go to the supermarkets and see the um, grandmas wearing traditional Navajo dress. On my reservation, you would see grandmas wearing traditional tea dress. You know, and the language was still intact. Um, it was just di very different. And I appreciate growing up in both environments, actually three environments, the tribal and Navajo, Sioux, and then the modern, modern side. Okay. Um, all right. Wow, so that must have been, well, you were pretty young. So I was like, oh, that must be such a culture shock for you to go from like Rosebud to, to Navajo, to Navajo Nation. But um, yeah, I'm Navajo too. <laughs> so it's always great to, we're just everywhere. Every time like I meet someone, chances are they're usually Navajo. <laughs> so it's just, it's always nice to see other um, Navajos or just AIA people, I suppose, but yeah. Um, okay, could you begin by telling us about your own relationship to the AIA and disability community, or if you could just um, expand on what you already mentioned or have more of like a timeline? My relationship is um, not just through personal or lived experience, but also on the professional side. Um, I feel like having those lived experiences when I was younger helped make me become a better advocate. And, you know, working in a nursing home as a CNA wasn't the most glamorous job, but there was a lot of learning to do. And I had my first um, CNA job back in New Orleans. I was going to school down south and there's a lot of different cultures in the New Orleans nursing homes too that aren't specifically mainstream. So was able to learn, you know, young age at 21, um, how different our cultures are, not just through being tribal, but just you know, geography too matters. Um, but I felt really, I feel connected to disabilities. I don't think there's a day that I go by without speaking about disabilities and advocating and making sure that our tribal input is there, even if I'm, I'm the only person sitting at the table. And sometimes that can be a hindrance because you know people get tired of hearing the same wheel <laughs> go round and round. But we need some help getting these oils, these wheels oiled. You know, we need other people to to step up and um, get involved and collaborate and share and make sure that we're part of the picture. Mm -hmm. So you not only have like lived experience, but you also have professional experience that kind of um, forms your relationship to the AIA disability community, correct? Yes, you know, I when there's um, opportunities to join boards or councils or committees, 
Um, I recognize that we don't have tribal, um, a tribal person there at the table or any tribal person. I joined coalitions. I was on the Ryan White Planning Council for a couple of years, um, benefiting, ad advocating for American Indians with HIV AIDS. You know, we have to keep our, our, um, we have to keep, we have to have that presence. You know, there's, there's a lot of interesting organizations out there and there's other organizations out there that are really extra interested in working with tribal communities. But again, the fear, I think, of some of our non-tribal folks coming to the table, being afraid of stepping on tribal toes or sovereign toes. You know, I appreciate that. Um, I also encourage them to get a little more you know, diversity and inclusion training. You know, go to the national, the NCD website, go to NICOA's website, I've been pushing your website quite a bit as a resource tool because you know internally as an organization, we're also talking about um, diversity and inclusion. And my DNI is focused on disabilities. Um, we have to have more, more individuals with disabilities afforded opportunities to be sitting in positions where I'm at, to be sitting in positions where you're at, you know, to be to be out there, to be allowed to be in, um, encouraged not allowed, encouraged um, to be involved and then keep moving that value piece, move it forward, you know, because our voices are important. And, you know, we're looking at different generations even here on this interview, three different generations with three different understandings of where we're coming from, what we've experienced. And my, my experiences may not be as uh, broad as others, which is why I like to focus on disabilities because there's a lot to learn around disabilities. Um, Robin, did you want to ask uh, Kimberly anything? No, I just want to say that I, I, we have heard throughout our interviews that um, the AI, AN voice is not included uh, by decision and policymakers. So um, you're reinforcing what seems to be an, an unfortunate phenomenon. Um, but I'm glad that you're there, that you're joining the boards and the committees. That's really important. Thank you. Yes, I serve, on, I um, am on the ASU Indigenous Summit Executive Committee. Uh, we had our summit in January, and I moderated the health disparity session. And again, I spoke about disabilities. Um, I'm also on the University of Arizona, their research um, committee, committee advisory council. So just taking opportunities to, I was asked to serve on that council, the research committee for disability specific. So it's been, uh, I know there's a lot more people than me, a lot more great things to be doing and just a lot of resources that we're not tapping into because we're just not seeing them. There's, there's a disconnect and all of us can do those bridges. Oh, those, how do you find time to do, like, how do you find time to sleep? I feel like you're on all of these, um, you're taking <laughs> charge of all these opportunities and but no, that's, that's amazing. So, okay, we'll go ahead and move on to the next question, uh, which is, does your tribal government have a law or resolution that prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities and requires equal opportunities for people with disabilities? That I couldn't answer on behalf of my tribe. I'm not very familiar with, with what they do or don't have. Um, speaking in general, I know that, um, we're pretty much going to be treating each other equal. Um, if we have to go to our tribal health department for services, the resources are there. I'm confident that our tribal health department provides those resources to our individuals that are out there. You know, I don't see anything disability specific, but I do see um, elders, you know, the elders programs 
And sometimes under the elders programs, under their umbrella, you find services for individuals with disabilities. I don't know how that how that's how that umbrella happened, but at least it's happening. Okay. Um All right. Um, do you feel comfortable answering the next question or is that also another question that you prefer not to? Well, the next um, question is like, because it's more tribe specific. Which? Um, oh, so it's, um, how does your tribe address support services for persons with disabilities and their families? such as home support programs, respite coverage for parents, uh, personal care attendants, and other caregivers. Well, what I'm hearing out there from my relatives that are disabled, um, they don't have those services available to them. Um, they have to sometimes go off reservation, but being so um, rural, you know, distanced, they sometimes just go without, you know, individuals that need um, assistive devices, wheelchairs, walkers, even at, in home you know, beds, chairs. Um, they don't have those type of services available. Specific, because I had an elder that um, needed a wheelchair or walker and couldn't get to the hospital. The cost, no, they couldn't get, get anything. They had to get it themselves. I think just limited resources. And I think sometimes maybe the person they're reaching out to may not want to be so re resourceful and look, look for them, you know, look for resources or identify them. So um, I think that's, that's what's happening from what I'm seeing through my elders and my, my relatives that are living up there on the road. Okay. I see. Wow. So would you, okay, so would, would you say that transportation is a huge factor into why they're not getting these services? Transportation, yes. Access to services is hindered by transportation. Okay. I'm just curious, do they also, because I know um, from what I've been seeing on the, on the reds, on the Navajo reservation, it's just that there are a lot of, um, non-support, non-emergency service vehicles. And I was just wondering if, have they ever like used those types of services to like go to appointments or could they use that to get the services they need or the things they need? I, there are tribal, they're not tribal transport, but there are Transport services, yeah, there are transport services available, and I know some tribes have their own transport services just to address this transportation issue, mm -hmm. you know, just to try to remedy it, but I don't um, see that many tribal transports happening out there, you know, missing medical appointments, missing benefit appointments, a lot of those things happen because of lack of transportation that impacting their access to services. Um, so just to, <laughs> um, oh my God, what is the word? <sighs> um, so what you're saying is just, you know, they, these services that are available, people aren't getting them because transportation is definitely a hindrance and they can't really find the resources to even it's get these services that I'm sure they qualify for. Right. I I've in my career, you know, I've worked with probably over 400 tribes, you know, um, and even in a couple of meetings, I think like a month and a half ago, two months, transportation was an issue. 
for individuals that had disabling conditions, um, getting to their required medical appointments to treat their condition. Um, even in you know, border towns like say Yuma and the Pocopa tribe, they still have transportation issues, even though they're relatively short distance from each, from each other. So, you know, a five mile transportation ride, it's somewhat hard to come by for some folks out there with minimal resources. Um, maybe they don't have a phone, you know, communications may also be a hindrance there too. But I think the um, access to transportation, trying to find waivers or ways to create waivers or can we create a waiver? you know, trying to get that, that transportation situation remedied so we can get folks the services that they need. That's both behavioral health and physical. Um, all right. Um, we'll go ahead and move to the next question. Uh, the next question is, what are the barriers to healthcare experienced by people with disabilities? And I know you've touched on transportation just from the previous question. What are the barriers to What are the barriers to healthcare experienced by people with disabilities in your tribal communities? The barriers to healthcare experienced by people with disabilities. Um, education about their disabling condition. You know, why do I have to take care of this? Why do I need to get seen as often as I need to? You know, they're telling me, why do I have to take so many pills? You know, not understanding um, thoroughly what is going on with their condition. They may have a couple conditions, not just one. So treating different things. Um, sometimes you see folks just throw in the towel saying, I'm not gonna deal with this, it's just too much too much to deal with. I don't have support services. That could even be in the form of peer support. It could be in the form of family member supporting. And sometimes the um, healthcare experience could be even, you know, crappy too. You know, the healthcare provider may not be as culturally sensitive as what our member needs, expects, or requires. So the healthcare provider you know, I took my mom, my grandmother, she was 84 and I went with her to the medical doctor and she was sitting there and he was talking directly to me and he acted like my grandmother wasn't there. You know, and I told him, do you need to speak directly to her and ask her, I'm not the patient, you know? And, um, but he still kept talking to me. So moving forward with the, um, you know, with the uh, exam, he just came right up to my grandmother and, you know, took her shirt down and stuck the test stethoscope on her and she freaked. She's like, what are you doing? You know, I said, sir, you cannot do that. You know, before you touch anybody, you really should be telling them why you're going to touch them and what you're doing, like a step-by-step, -step, mm -hmm. because some of our elders require that, you know, because my grandmother, the way she had, um, the way she, you know, her, her reaction was like, oh my God, what are you doing, you know, granddaughter, you know, and so that, that type of, um, maybe that's just how doctors do, you know, that doctor manner, I don't know, bad, bedside manners, um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's not always a fit, and in some um, situations, it can be really um, a barrier, you know, my grandmother didn't want to go back and see that provider again. There was nothing wrong with her, it was just an exam, you know, so she told him if it's not broke, don't fix it. So she passed away without having any medication. And she was um, um, fluent Lakota speaker. And mm -hmm. she, she was very familiar with her surroundings. So I think the cultural side of things for our individuals with disabilities, we could have our providers participate in cultural um, sensitivity training. I see. Um, so I have, a, I have an offhanded question. You talk about education for people who have this uh, certain disease. I don't know if that's the right word. <laughs> 
But um, when they do have that, where would they, where, like, where would they go? Because you say they, they don't have any resources. And I do understand that. Like, even with my grandmother, it was hard for her to understand this is what's happening. And um, and she still didn't understand it, but was like, oh, okay, yeah, sure. Um, so I was just wondering if you, and it was kind of difficult for us because we weren't too, we weren't getting the information that we needed to um, to have it be simplified and to be understandable. So I was just wondering if you where would you, most people go for resources such as that, or would they just do Google on reservation? Yeah, I'd like to you know I'd like to a lot of community health reps <clears throat> you know on the reservation mm -hmm. that do make the door to door. And, you know, the community health groups are members of the community, too, so they know the community just as well as we do, you know, we're residents. Um, they can be that bridge, you know, in regards to resources. And I actually did approach the Arizona community health rep group to give them the disability toolkit training. So uh, <laughs> I just, I mean, they're frontline people, you know, and if they go into a home and they recognize you know, this individual has a condition and they're not getting treated for, you know, their front line where they can trigger, they can trigger that treatment. They can go back and make the referrals and create those resources for them. If it's a child, get the education, local school involved. You know, my child has an IEP and they communicate pretty well. One of my friends, girlfriends lives on the reservation and her child has an IEP and they haven't met in over a year. So I'm able to share with her what I'm what I'm doing and sharing with her what she can expect through IEP progress and working with her school um, teachers, the counselors, or her school team. And you know, some of the language that's used in these IEPs can be complex. I ask them to, for me, I don't understand all the jargon from the education side, from the school side. So let's speak at the sixth grade level because I don't understand. But that's climbing a seat for the next person. Keep on speaking at the same level so we all understand the same thing consistently. Otherwise, it's just over our head. We don't, we don't know. Yeah, I, I, you know, in all of these interviews, no one has really mentioned community health reps, so I'm glad you brought up that point. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, just having people be comfortable enough to be like, yeah, can you explain this to me in a more simplified manner? Um, okay, are there any other barriers you'd like to add or, or for you? Good on this question because you, you talked about transportation and then also education. Um, yeah, transportation and education. I, I, the, the question, um, are children with disabilities treated differently in your school systems? I'd like to say yes as a blanket statement. I've gone, you know, traveled throughout different reservations and do um, interact with the school systems, the uh, tribal education departments. And through different tribal education departments, we found some really serious concerns in regards to tribal children living on the reservation that should be in school when they're five, six, seven, eight, nine, going on up. And found quite a few tribal children that were um, never left home. You know, they're seven years old and nobody from the school systems reached out, no one from any system has reached out to see why they're not in school, you know, and part of the parents' response, I've had like seven, eight parents, families, well, single, you know, moms with their children. And um, usually, yeah, mostly they were just parent, mom, one mom, one parent. And um, their concern was um, the mistrust factor. What if I do bring my child to school and you do say my child's in, um, disabled, are they gonna to try to take my child away from me because I don't have adequate services in my home? You know, you're looking at social determinants of health, um, you know, poverty impacting education, poverty impacting food sovereignty, poverty impacting 
just, you know, I, I hate, I'm, I, I apologize for um, sounding like I'm speaking down about our community in regards to poverty, but we know that that's real and the impacts that it has, not just on our daily living, but also on the healthcare. So if you have, uh, you know, these children, um, you know, I spoke with the moms and, you know, shared with them why they want to reach out to the resources because their child isn't going to get any better without them. And if you want to improve the quality of life, you do want to seek out resources. And if there's something that you don't trust, whoever you're working with them, explain to them why you don't trust. You know, as soon as um, the one mother gave an approval to allow me to contact the state tribal liaison from DDD, Disability Developmental Disabilities Division, um, the tribal liaison was out there the next day. <laughs> it was just really disappointing for them to say they had, you know, pretty much combed through the community seeking individuals needing services. It's like we skipped over a whole, whole lot of families here that do need those services. So just the ruralness, I think, has that disconnect, but also the mistrust factor for our school age students. Um, and then our students imagine how they feel if they are in the school and be tr being treated differently. You know, they have to have some type of seamless process where if you're gonna pull a student out for an IEP, you're not doing it in the middle of the class. So you're kind of singling them out that, hey, this is a special needs student and they're coming over for special needs programs. You know, because my daughter, they did that to my daughter and she came home crying. And I requested um, a different process that they use so the um, IEP teacher doesn't, special needs teacher doesn't go in and pull her out of class in front of all the students. You know, that's a private um, session between her and the, the um, special needs teacher, not between my daughter and all of her classmates. Mm -hmm. it, it keeps that student um, confident, confident that they're working with their IEP plan and that they're making progress and they're doing it at their own pace. But when you have that, um, that insensitivity there, she felt like really bad. And she's like, I don't want, why am I different? And she has a praxia. So she has had speech and it's an everyday thing because it, it impacts her reading and then this other stuff and kind of like snowballs if you don't take care of it. So all, all of my children have had a praxia. Um, it's not necessarily special needs or special ed. It's something else that she has to have help and coaching. And my oldest daughter, she's actually graduating from ASU in May um, with an honors degree in business from ASU School of Business. So that's how we keep, um, that's how I kept my, my family sheltered when managing IEPs to avoid that stigma from attacking them so mm -hmm. they don't aren't made to feel dumb or inadequate. We resist that. We can, we can work with it, but that's the kind of confidence you want to build and instill in others that may not have that type of um, role model or figure, you know, shadow to follow. So I followed shadows and I know how important it is to speak when you can and to find the best words when you have that moment. It sounds like you protected your daughter's privacy and, and fostered her independence. Yes. May I ask a question? It sounds from what you've been describing, like the systems are fragmented. So like the school system doesn't know that there are disabled children at school age, disabled children at home and not attending school and insensitive healthcare providers. And, have you seen where there is a system that's cohesive, where people are culturally literate and, and that the services are accessed or is it, is it, there's always places where it's broken and there's, and people fall through the cracks? I even say, you know, like with the IHS system, the Indian healthcare system, you know, it, it is a healthcare system for American Indians. So we have those sensitivities in place. You know, we understand culture, we understand heritage and history. Um, one thing that there, there's not much emphasis on is disabilities. 
you know, you can go to IHF's website today and there's no resources there for individuals with disabilities or individuals that have recently become disabled. And I also, I think, I think that maybe, I think that's, that's a need, you know, because I just heard on a healthcare call a couple of weeks ago that the COVID-19 is now considered a disabling condition. So, you know, whether, I think more folks are looking at disabilities at the physical side, not at the um, invisible, you know, the disabilities you can't see. You know, so I think more, I don't think there's any ideal system in place right now, considering, you know, folks are trying to do a lot of things at one time and not necessarily focusing on anything specific. But I do believe that disabilities should be focused, should be a focus and having worked with social security, our statistics for American Indians tell us that we're going to become disabled before we reach full retirement age. And full retirement age for me is 67, you know, and the social security statistics specifically state that, which is really uncommon for other communities. You know, other communities don't have that statistic going against them. Yeah, the statistics I've read is that uh, the vast majority of American Indian Alaska Natives and probably the entire population in the world, uh, before people die, they will be disabled. I know with my own parents, they, my dad has diabetes and my type 2 and my mom, they both parents have uh, macular degeneration. So it seems to me that IHS as part of understanding their role in the community would be prepared to support people with disabilities because eventually we're all gonna have a disability. Right. So that's a good, it was a good- Housing, point. transportation, education, everything that we do, it has to be, um, they have to fluff it up a little bit and just keep on moving forward because, um, because those statistics are right around the corner for some of us. Plus, we're living longer. All right. I'll just um, okay, to sum up your response uh, for our children with disabilities treated differently in your school systems. You believe, from your experience, yes, they are treated differently. Um, parents do have a mistrust factor about how the schools are taking care of their children or how they will be treated. Um, is that pretty much some of the points that you mentioned? All right. Um, so we'll if I can just add one more thing is that uh, they use a lot of jargon and they don't define the jargon for the parents. And so there's a lot of miscommunication and that's very intimidating. It's, it's another form of insensitivity. That's what I heard. Yes. We have some parents through, through their own experience you know, raising a child with disabilities. Um, they become some of our more stronger advocates. Yeah, we've we've seen that most of uh, <laughs> portion of our of our interviewees are um, parents with. I think you know children. from a couple of the interviewees that I sent you, you could hear yeah. that through their voice. And I have known those interviewees for um, let's say I've lived here for twenty three years, you know. So I've known I've known their children since they were really little kids, you know, four or five years old. And wow, without that advocacy, knowledge, um, adamant coming from the parent, the mom, um, I th I'm pretty sure that the successes wouldn't be there, you know, but it just takes, takes a strong focus and to dwell when you have to. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that sometimes folks aren't so forthright with information where you've got to go into riddles with them to get what you're looking for. You know, and it's just why can't you just tell me right now or share with me? You know, just just to have that um, engagement you know, at, at the intellectual level where people aren't speaking down to you, 
because mm -hmm. I have people that speak down to me because they think that I only speak Lakota and I don't understand. <laughs> so I'm like, I understand everything that you're saying. <laughs> you know, so that's how I learn. And sometimes it's intimidating, you know, but I'm not one to intimidate. I've been intimidated and don't feel too well. Sorry, I had to like mute myself because there's a person who's very enthusiastic about his motorcycle, just revving the engine out there. Uh, okay, uh, so we'll go ahead and move on to the next question, which is what services, supported employment, transportation assistance, job coach for employment for people with disabilities come from inside your tribe, outside your tribe? I think outside your tribe, we're really rural, like Hopi, like Hopi rural, like on a cliff, <laughs> on a, so very rural. Um, we have to use what IHS provides us. You know, there's not too many um, border towns near our reservation, and to get to the closest city, it's about two and a half hours away. You know, so community health reps, you know, um, Bureau of Indian Education, those resources uh, that they should have available for us. So those would be basically some of the programs that are sitting on the reservation in the form of IHS, Bureau of Indian Education. Um, I think that's about it. I don't even think our tribal housing helps out when folks need ramps or accommodations. And I think that goes back to the um, ADA not being exercised on tribal lands. I think if they did, we'd have better outcomes. Um, all right. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, move to the next question, if that's okay. Uh, what changes would you like to see made either within your tribe or others that would result in improved services and programs to assist people with disabilities who live in Indian country, to assist AIA and people with disabilities wherever they may live? How, well, to, to see those improved services and programs, we have to have them first. You know, we have a lot of programs out here in urban areas, you know, um, off reservation that have services, but they're not tailored specifically to tribal folks. Mm -hmm. So having a program or a service that specifically addresses the needs of American Indians with disabilities would, would benefit our tribal communities. You know, we have off reservation folks coming onto the res reservation without all of that cultural substance that our tribal folks need um, to, to make their, their care count. You know, I think we need more folks, the more services specific for Indian country, designed by Indian country, and about Indian country. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's, a, that's a great point to make. Um, so as far as having these outside um, organizations come in, you mentioned that they should have some type of like tribal sensitivity or would they rather, like, what did you mean by that? Would they, should they consult with a tribal liaison and have them say like, hey, this is, or I guess a sensitivity training. Is that what you meant by that comment? Right, you know, cause you do have tribal liaisons that are non-native too. You know, mm -hmm. they have, um, they have uh, knowledge of the, they have program knowledge but you do have tribal licenses that are non-tribal too. So, you know, again, trainings, I, I know that the state federal organizations um, have diversity and inclusion, but more tailored around tribal. You know, when, when you have a tribal person that has um, 
a disabling condition, you know, they're going to a provider that doesn't understand why they're not speaking openly. I tell tribal folks with disabilities, when I'm speaking, when I would speak, would be speaking to a group of tribal folks with disabilities, which was a lot. When you go in to see, we'll use, for example, Social Security. When you go in to see them, they ask you how you're doing, you say you're doing fine, but yet you're not doing fine. You know, you really need to be um, open with them and let them know that you're not feeling fine. When you go see your doctor, you, you tell them you're feeling fine. You know, they're documenting all this stuff and this can go against you because if you say you're feeling fine and you're not, they're saying documenting in their notes, they came in looking great, blah, blah, blah. It impacts, but sometimes we cloak those things, we shield those things because we're afraid of what that answer, what our answer might lead us to. You know, I don't want to be um, diagnosed with another condition. I don't want to have to take more medicine, but see they're harming themselves more by not sharing how they truly feel. And I think that for us as Indian folks, we're very humble. You know, we don't, we don't want to get fixed if it's not broken. Yeah. So you stay quiet. And that that doesn't help. That's that's not going to get them to where they need to be in regards to adherence to their treatment or even feeling better for another day. You know, so trying to teach, you know, training, not training them how to respond, but just saying, really be open, not, not saying you're lying. So I don't want to use the word honest, but be open um, in regards to sharing with your provider how you're feeling. Because if you leave the doctor's office and you're feeling bad, you're going to leave the doctor's office going home feeling bad with nothing to take care of it. So that's how elementary it might seem, but that's the approach that even I myself have to take um, when taking care of my children. You know, I have adult children too, but um, just not trying to shield anything. Just be open and be okay with it being open because it's not going to get you in trouble. This is it's the mistrust. Yeah, and I, I understand. And I've, like you said, I've, <laughs> as you're saying this, I could already see it happening within my own family of how you know either my parents or my grandma, you know, they don't want to go to the doctor because of that fear. Um, and I think that's we. In an earlier question, you mentioned that's where the education for the for the person comes in and just letting them know that, you know, yeah, you now have this, but you also have this other stuff that could help remedy that. So it's not such a hindrance. So yeah, I think having that um, type of training, because I feel like for AIA and people, maybe that's just unique to us. I'm not too sure if other um, groups do have that also, but um, but yeah, yeah, that's that's a great point. I <laughs> this is another reason why we love interviewing people because they make such great points where I wouldn't be able to like connect them and just yeah. I'm sorry. What were you gonna add something? Oh no, I was just you know our tribal nuances. You know, others outside the tribal circle may not understand what they could be. You know, I'm I'm married. And I shouldn't be looking at other males in the eyes, you know. And when, you know, years ago when I first came here from the reservation, I really had that thing of looking away or looking down or kind of like looking through or just avoiding that, con that eye contact because that's how, that's how we do. And here in the city, it's like if you don't make the eye contact, they'll make you make it until you do. You know, like get in your face and look at me. You know, it's like, oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. It, you know, and even even other tribal nuances. You know, having our having our period. You know, we're not even supposed to be in public. You know, we're supposed to be at home, away from people, because we're very sacred at that time, and we shouldn't be walking in others' paths and crossing other people's paths while in this condition. You know, so these are just some of the the in in deep type of sensitivities that others may not know or understand why we're not being standoffish, but we will take a step back when maybe we shouldn't be, be in the circle at that time, because for us, it may be tribal, like culturally inappropriate to be there you know, during our time in the community of strangers. So it's like the, 
those are just some of the things. And I know these things because I teach, have taught my daughters them. My oldest is 23. So here, you know, treat, training, treating, um, sharing with her our tribal um, appropriateness, our tribal uh, etiquette, you know, as being a, a woman or a female. So disabilities can also impact the gender differently, male and female. Oh no, I forgot. Oh, it was what changes would you like to see made? Was, that was the question we were on, correct? I was a bit, right. <laughs> I was a bit involved in the conversation and I forgot. Um, well, at least a hub, you know, create a hub, a community hub, you know, mm -hmm. where our community members can go, even if it's, you know, um, a base, you know, an office in the wellness center, an office in the hospital, somewhere that they can also maintain their privacy, but a, a hub where they can get these resources. Um, you know, if you're living rural and you're living in tribal housing, you're not gonna find somebody to come out and fix tribal housing because it has to be tribal housing, you know? So maybe they can engage with tribal housing and say, we need this, a ramp, how can you help us? You know, just to get those other resources that they need as far as home accommodations. So, they can be at home and enjoy being at home. And it doesn't have to be so negative when they have to leave the house or wanna leave the house or go visit other people's homes. You know, just a hub where from housing, employment, healthcare, um, just education, you know, just something for our folks to get to. And I know in the, in the virtual reality, you know, we're living at right now, this could be really be possible because you could go into an office over at IHS and they say, here's a computer. We have some resources there. My co is here, this is here, this is here. You know, and teach them how to access the resources, not just they're there, find them, you know, but really be hands-on. That's a, a good idea. I, I've seen something similar to that. Um, some public schools have something called a parent resource center. So it's, a, it's like a classroom and they have, clothing for the children and the family members. They have uh, resources to access food if there's food insecurity. They have employment, English language classes. Like there's a whole array of resources provided through. And the thing that's so important is that the, the Family Resource Center is operated by the community, by the parents. The people who walked in those shoes and said, yeah, I need it access to uh, you know, job training or whatever it is. So I think that idea of having a hub like at a IHS facility is brilliant. Uh, that's really a great idea. I, I just like to throw a question out there while we're talking about this. Um, as far as like AI, AN, disability organizations, do you see any um, coordination or just like known disability orgs that could, that tries, or that is the hub for those resources or do you just find them through word of mouth? I think through the word of mouth, but the, the mouths are very few and rare. <laughs> I mean, people, you know, like you hear, you know, like we hear about the um, the Indian grapevine, okay, mm -hmm. that, that needs a lot of different information sharing, but not specifically around disabilities. You know, you hear and see the suicide prevention warm lines. How about a disability warm line? You know, just something to mirror other um, topics that are out there, but are, are receiving greater awareness. Dis disability, we need more resources in disability for disabilities for individuals with a disability. Why not a hotline, <laughs> a warm line, just something for them to, you know, they, they may be entering into a different stage with their condition, you know, and go home and forget to ask the questions. Oh, well, maybe I can call this number and get some help, but it's tribal specific, you know, the tribal, tribal disability warm line. I don't know how else to call it, but resources and just something that you can get up 
by picking up the phone. You know, the internet is so crazy. It's like not not a lot of people have it either. You know, and specific when you're looking at disabilities, our disability community may not have access to um, virtual resources, virtual meetings. Um. Yeah, I think that's uh, another one of the themes that we've been hearing about is just creating a central resource where people are able to, you know, find this uh, information that they need. Um, okay, we'll go to the next question, which is what suggestions or recommendations do you have that would improve communication and collaboration among the federal, state, tribal governments on issues that would improve support and services to people with disabilities in Indian country. And I think for this one, we could also um, add on like tribal organizations, like I said. I would like to see, because this, this usually comes down from the top, which is at the federal level. You know, policies are made and then they trickle down to the states and then they move on over to tribal governments if they protect or apply, but I think that um, one thing that hasn't happened is tribal consultation around disabilities with the tribes, you know, or with the healthcare facilities out there on reservations to share with the federal programs um, what they're not doing or what's not working and what the federal program thinks is working and it's not happening. You know, I, I can go back to um, federal government, social security, they're really pushing internet online services so you know they want the public to go to the internet and set up a social security account my social security account to access your benefit information and to make changes folks out there in indian country aren't able to do that if you look out there um in indian country there's no social security offices there's 575 tribes there's, uh, I think, close to 1,124 social security field offices. And many of those parallel the tribal communities. Many of them parallel, like the Mesa social security office parallels the Salt River tribe. But you don't see too much um, engagement going on there. You know, they have a huge tribe and they have um, wellness programs and they do have some disability uh, services available but you don't see that engagement at the local level where they could be enhancing services. They could be reaching out to individuals that can't get to the offices through tribal programs. So just the collaboration um, starting at the federal, at the top from the federal, and then that would trickle down through the states, you know, guiding them, guiding the states in regards to what they could be doing. So I would say um, a tribal consultation you know, NICOA could request a tribal consultation. Anybody could request a tribal consultation around disabilities. Um, but it, it hasn't happened, you know, it just, just to focus, what can we do for you? you know, how can we help? How can we integrate our services into your community? How can we better be better at that? Um, the state, I think the state does follow the feds. They do follow the feds, the feds lead. So starting at the top. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so starting with the federal level, having someone, a tribal, tribal liaison, being able to talk to the federals the feds and just let them know like these are the services that we need this is what i'm hearing and from there um the federal will then trickle down to the states and yeah so is that what i'm am i correct in reiterating what you're saying they're gonna, skip, they're gonna skip the federal site should have the direct consultation with the tribal governments you know the, the tribal governments um they can also explore requesting a tribal consultation, but it hasn't happened. You know, I haven't seen any direct tribal cons consultation around different topics impacting any country and disabilities is one of them. All right. I, I have 
one quick question, if you don't mind. So I also heard you say that uh, nonprofit organizations like NACOA could also request tribal consultations and say, go to the Navajo Nation or Laguna Pueblo or somewhere and say, how can we serve you? What do you need? Did you say that as well? You could ask the BIA, hey, what are you doing for individuals with disabilities out there in Indian country? You could ask Social Security, you know, what are you doing for individuals? The same question. You know, you, you could ask um, Indian Health Service, you know, and wait to see how they respond. But I think that those kind of questions would actually trigger back that federal ear that whoever's talking to, um, you know, they have that responsibility under White House executive order, but it hasn't happened. We have policy changes, policy changes that impact um, tri tribal folks that get per capita monies. And sometimes our individuals with disabilities rely on those per capita monies, but when those per capita monies impact their benefits, that becomes an issue. So that's where that consultation is important because just coming from the social security experience, um, some of those money should have been excluded from counting. And I've had a lot of direct consultations with tribal leaders, but not at the federal level. I had one-on-ones, but you know, the agency um, had, had not considered to have, have that tribal consultation when policies impacting tribal tribes, um, they should have had consultations. So there's a lot out there, the tribes just don't know. Okay, let's uh, go ahead and move on to the next question, which is, what is one positive action event activity that you see happening in the AI and disability community currently happening? Okay, the NACO is one. <laughs> the toolkit, the revision of the toolkit. Um, that's major. You know, considering it hadn't been revised for about 20 years. And now the, the new information, updated information, um, this is an important tool for us advocates, coalitions, organizations, leaders to get involved with, to be on board with what's happening with disabilities and Indian country. Um, another positive event activity is the upcoming April 2022, American Indian Youth Disability Summit. So it'll be on its second year. And this year's summit had 218 registered to attend virtual conference from across the nation, including Connecticut, Maine, um, in even Alaska Native Villages, had a couple of tribal chiefs from the Alaska Native Villages on the call too. So 200, and at the end of the day, we had like 189 still on the call. So we didn't have very many drop, which I felt was great, you know, as the coordinator. Um, we focused on resiliency because of the COVID. You know, we wanted to make sure we kept posting, pushing that message of resiliency for our young people to, to learn from their care providers, um, their elders, their parents, their schools, focus on resiliency because those were pretty tough times for um, Indian country when quarantine and isolation happened, you know, uh, tribal lockdowns. So we're planning the second annual summit. Um, you said uh, is involved. They're the they're going to provide the IT for us. So this is going to be a non-cost event. I hope that the speakers that we can attract will speak for us for free because we don't have a budget. But it's for the youth. And it is a virtual summit. It, we're not gonna do, I'm not gonna do, uh, we won't do hybrid. You know, that's just too much. And it, we may lose a lot of our audience for those that are chiming in from outside of Arizona. So wanting to create this best practice here, focusing on American Indian youth, um, tribal youth and disabilities. It's gonna be a great summit. We have a lot of um, different topic ideas. And I wanted to also ask you, um, both of you, we don't have a theme yet. <laughs> <laughs> we we have a theme. It's kind of like gathering around resources, gathering voices. It's kind of like the, the general summit. 
um, that's going to be the week before in March, March 28th of 2022. So the general summit is American Indian Disability Summit. Um, our focus this year is going to be on gathering voices and resources. Um, so I don't know how we're going to expand on that, but we're not going to use the same theme for the youth. We're, we're wanting to, to do something different, maybe make it cultural prevention foundation. You know, culture, culture is our foundation for prevention. I mean, I don't know, but um, just trying to make it so that it's youth oriented. And this year, I, I hate, I don't say that I own this, but as the founder for this youth summit, um, this is the second one. And my idea is to eventually have it youth led, youth driven. So, you know, I'm part of the general planning committee. I've been on the planning committee for 17 years and chaired it for the first five. And I know what a viable event looks like. I've experienced it. And that's my only efforts in regards to the youth summit is to make it in creating a viable event. So our youth will have a planning. They're gonna be part of the planning. And I did invite Mateo Treetop to serve as my co MC for this year. So we can start seasoning and developing our young people with disabilities to be where they can make the most um, influence, have the most influence and change for those that follow them. So I shared with um, my planning team, which there's five of us, that eventually the youth will lead this event and I'm just helping to make it grow. So Mateo's gonna be the MC. I'm serving as his mentor for the year, and he's invited to um, join the planning meeting so he can be on board. I'm not gonna um, keep him out of the loop. He's invited to every planning meeting as the co-MC, so he can speak about a lot of different things that are happening as the planning process begins and as we move forward. And it's to develop him. The next thing is to, um, create this so our, our youth have ownership. You know, we want them to have ownership. So this will grow with them. And anything new that they learn, I'm gonna expect them to bring it into the picture so we can all learn from them. And I'm really happy that I have a youth group that has talent to um, lead. We're gonna have a virtual cafe. Um, so I'm going to have the youth lead that networking session and then um, at noon and then on the breakout session at noon, I'm going to do a physical activity and it's going to be like wheelchair exercises, you know, for individuals that have that limited mobility. And there's a lot of great resources and tools out there to do those, you know, exercises and arms and things. So um, just trying to build them up to where the general session is at but keep them at the same pace because we don't want anybody getting behind on my shift. I, I, I really um, believe and feel that this summit should be led by you, trouble you, share their experiences. And I have seen, um, they had the um, Tribal Workforce Development Summit a couple of weeks ago, and they had youth from as young as seventh grade speaking you know the first part of the morning they were very timid but then at the end of the program you know they're raising their hand and they're speaking and that's what you want to instill in them is that um just that good feeling you know i'm involved and now i can speak and i was shy this morning but i'm not shy now and just to help them break that break that feeling of being um isolated so want to help develop them and just um, give them communication skills, give them you know, public affairs skills, give them some financial education skills, just help develop them all around the whole picture. What an awesome vision. You know, you, you asked um, about a theme, but I think you spoke to the theme. And it's also something that Mateo spoke to when we interviewed him, which was, having the young people influence change. He made this comment about how um, older people are 
can be in a rut and they don't, they can't see what the young people see, you know, like the young people see more, more avenues or opportunities or something. So um, empowerment, youth voice, I don't know what your theme is, but you spoke directly to it just now. Um, and he's remarkable. Thank you for uh, sending him our way. Yes, I, I'm very, I, I feel very um, privileged and honored to be um, his, his mentor because he speaks right to the point and he doesn't, um, he's not about fluff. <laughs> he will tell you exactly and be direct. And, you know, when I was looking at, you know, I was speaking with the planning committee, I had identified some topics, um, but these were topics that I felt were, were exceptional and really needed to be brought out. One was cyberbullying. And mm -hmm. you know, I'm gonna reach out to the attorney general's office to get them to come and speak on cyberbullying. So we can also address human trafficking. You know, because in the rural areas, a lot of that nonsense goes on through the internet. Right. And we want our youth to be cautious in regards to what they're pushing and why are they trying to capture this information, you know, so cyberbullying. Um, and then I was looking at some of these other topics that I had listed and went to the planning committee and I'm like, this isn't going to work because I'm way far from being a youth. You know, I'm about 30 years older from being a youth. <laughs> I think you're a youth until you're like 24, 25, you know, and I'm not very <laughs> a good representative of the youth because right now I'm operating as a mom and I'm trying to tell you guys what you need. And I can only do that with my four. I can't do that with anybody else's children. So we need to um, bring the youth into the picture because I can't tell them if, um, are, you, are you impacted by truancy during you know, virtual school days, you know, I, so it's best to hear from the youth in regards to what they need. And Mateo's involved in quite a few different um, councils, clubs, coalitions. Um, he's on a governor's advisory council. So he somewhat has his fingers on the pulse of what's going out there with disabilities, but we need to make that tie in with Indian country. And he's, he's a good voice for it. He was also, um, the Mark Harris Leadership Award recipient a couple of years ago, where you know he competed with adults for that award. So we're going to have a youth um, award to Jimmy Warren Youth Leadership Award, and um, only eligible Arizona tribal youth um, can be nominated. So it's a lot. It's a lot, and I'm really honored. And I haven't stopped talking about this NICOA kit because I've used it in the past, Desiree. Um, there was also another piece uh, that that I forgot was um, oh, dang it, I forgot. I forgot. Anyways, <laughs> darn it! <laughs> I never do that. I always remember. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, I forgot. Um, yeah, but if you if you would like to um, you know add anything to the youth summit or even the general summit, just reach out. You know, if you have a youth speaker, um, someone that you know, mm -hmm. uh, reach out because it's not just limited to Arizona. You know, it's, and it's virtual, so it, it it matters. And I think that we're making it matter because folks that have access to the internet can participate and. We do want to reach out to the schools, you know, maybe identify a session that maybe could chime in with the class. You know? mm -hmm. So we're trying to make it that type of um, interactive is getting getting the schools to come on board or you know, just to be a part of the summit. Yeah, you know, if I have someone in mind, I'll be sure to send them your way. Um, yeah, wow, that's that is an amazing that's this is an amazing way to like, to just end the interview <laughs> because, you know, we are, the youth is the next, so the next generation. So yeah, it's, it's amazing to hear that. Um, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Were you going to say the youth, the youth, the youth are responsible for that seventh generation. 
you know, my my daughters and then their children will be that, my ch grandchildren will be that seventh generation that we're talking about, you know, so we have time now where we can start making that difference and planting that seed of information with our young people, disabled or not, you know, the youth are our greatest voice and our greatest asset out there in Indian country. And it takes leaders like you, Desiree, and you, Robin, to take this type of project and make it happen and get other organizations on board to be a part of it. You know, um, I did mention on the General Disabilities Summit about the NICOA Disability Toolkit. <laughs> and I was like, well, maybe I could have a train the trainer on the side, you know, for one hour or something, or, you know, a, a talking circle or something, but to get the toolkit out and get some trainers on board. So that's something we'd like to work through. Um, that opportunity is available um, just to get NICOA Give, give NICOA, I'd be the trainer. If you can't make it here, it's virtual. It's well, actually, it's a hybrid summit. So really would like to um, afford you the opportunity, NICOA, to roll, if the toolkit's ready by then, to roll out the trainer trainer session. Okay, and yeah. Well, if, if, oh. we, if we did it here and here during that time, you know, be in person, um, we could also afford to do it um, virtual because the whole conference is going to be virtual so they'll be able to accommodate it but just just keep that in your in your pocket if you need it well um even if the training isn't ready we could still do like a presentation and say this is the resource ebook you know you can um look into that so yeah i'd be i'd be more than interested and okay. in happy to to be a part of it okay i put you i did i i I mentioned it in the last call. So um, I'll let them know that I spoke with NICOA and tentatively, I'll just put tentative because I know you're going to do it, but um, tentatively they, they accepted and just work out the logistics from there. Like if you're going to be here and how you want to do the training, because I'll be one of your first trainees. That's amazing to hear. Um, since, since Kimberly, since we have you right here, when you say you're going to be the, one of the first trainings, we had pictured um, separate trainings by chapter. So there would be one that's focused on education, another on employment and vocational rehabilitation, et cetera. Um, do you think there's a need for like a one overview training kind of as an intro or in, in other words, what would be um, meaningful for the purpose of this summit that you're talking about? I think condense the chapter trainings, you know, condense, like touch a little bit on each chapter. Okay. You know, cause there's some um, chapters there that some might not understand about the topic. You know, like I'm talking about the school stuff, the IEP stuff. <laughs> That's yeah. pretty technical. <laughs> it's very technical. Yeah. 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 I mean, housing, you know, just some of the topics, independent living, what could that mean? But the philosophy is still the same. It's just the resources were adjusted for this revision, right? So, so um, each chapter would have like, you know, the purpose of this chapter is to explain X, Y, Z, with an emphasis on self advocacy, right? And then here are the resources you can access to learn more about how to get your needs met or help others get their needs met in terms of housing or transportation or education or whatever, employment. Does that yes. sound? Like accomplishing, accomplishing uh, living, independent living. Okay. Um, how, how, what resources are there in order for me to accomplish independent living or what is transition? You know, what is transition-based services? You know, just to clarify some of the more technical, things but bring them out in a more simple fashion i have i hope i'm not overstepping my boundaries but as we're there's a race so i'm asking if this is okay but as the training's being developed can we reach out for you and get your input um and while it's in development because yes, you're on the front lines and you, you know what am, people need to hear and learn. I am very excited. I'm telling you, <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like it's my birthday coming up when this toolkit rolls out. 
it's just there's a need and it really does satisfy the need in regards to providing that specific training targeted training specific for indian country you know we can take um we can go to ncd's website but it's really high level information is what it seems like because the level of reading the readability level i think must be at 10th or 11th grade and i i really do feel that um you know i used to advocate for the eighth grade level as a um, communications specialist and i'm advocating for the sixth grade level because you know times change and vocabulary changes and it's even at the eighth grade level it's a little bit more technical for some of our folks that need to have that readability available to them yeah, and they say newspapers are written at the sixth grade level. I don't know if that's true, but that's what occurred. Yeah, well, my my organization, I, I shared that, so everybody's writing at the sixth grade level. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it may that will, have it to be, that will have to be it part improved. of the revision of the toolkit, I think, because there are parts that are quite technical. Yeah, it, it, improved, it improved dialogue. It improved um, keeping jargon out of the conversation. You know, it improved a lot of areas that we were creating our own communication barriers by using um, language that was a little bit over some people's heads. And like I said, I'm I have that situation happen with me too. It may just maybe the readability, or maybe the individual um, has English as their second language. You know, that happens with tribal folks too. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, I have some young people that English is their second language, and that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, that's really amazing to hear. Um, okay, uh, was, is there anything else you'd like to um, expand on or uh, talk about before we um, sign off? No, but I did, I will, um, I did my grandmother like years ago, she was on the founding um, founders of Nicoa. Oh, yeah. Chancina oh, Yellow Rope. Yeah. And I found um, her articles about the Nicoa. And I have a pic. I was there when they had their first um, Nicoa conference in Albuquerque. I think it was like in the sixth or seventh grade. But I was there with my grandmothers. And um, I have pictures of them around the round table um, mm -hmm. of the first Nicoa gathering. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So I'm, like this, I'm really happy to be part of her legacy, just to be here and have another yellow rope on board after, you know, what, 30, 40 years back in the 70s. So I'm, I'm going to be a member of NICO and I hope someday to serve on your council and hope someday to be doing something more to um, move forward with NICOA. <laughs> I believe in NICOA. That's awesome. Wow. So no, thank you. I appreciate this. And um, if there's anything else that I can lend, any resources or anything else to, um, feel free to reach out. And I'm really excited for uh, the toolkit to, to roll out and looking forward to it. So you, you guys are doing a great job over there at NICOA. And I wish I lived closer to Albuquerque so I could see you guys in person. Well, thank you. Your inspiration. Yes, thank you. Hey, well, I wish you both happy holidays and just the best. I got two weeks left in this program, so <laughs> it's probably from ear to ear. Can't can't wait. But thank you guys. I, I feel like saying I love you, but um, that might be <laughs> pushing it too far. <laughs> it's been a great hour spending with you guys. Thank you. Likewise. Good luck with your schooling. Thank you both, and it's great to see you. We'll see you again soon. We'll see you again soon. Bye.